Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 to 15. God says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. May it penetrate our hearts. May it change us from the inside out. May we have a new vigor, a new hunger, a new thirst for you. What is revival? Anybody been to a revival? You know, we can set this big tent up out in the parking lot, right? And we can invite these preachers to come. <laughs> and for a week, we have these every night have something, you know, preaching and, and going on and teaching about Christ and bringing the whole community. I mean, doesn't that sound exciting? You know, everybody's cooking and preparing and, and doing all this stuff. The food sounds good. The food is awesome in this place, I'll tell you. Yeah, we got some great cooks here. Is that really revival? I mean, that's what we've come to know. Just like we come to know the church is this building. But is really the church this building, or is it us? Yeah, that's what the church is, right? It's us. It's not the building. Well, revival also has to do with us, okay? Not with the tent. Not with all the food. And you know, even the people that do this, by the end of the week, many of them are relieved it's over. Because it's a pretty <laughs> intense week, you know, uh, going on. So God's saying, what's true re what is true revival? Well, it's a sovereign act by a sovereign God. Okay? It's the Holy Spirit acting in his people, right? Reviving us. Reviving us. Now, what do you think of when you hear the word revive? Well, someone drowning, right? Yeah. You know, if somebody's drowning, you got to revive them. you got to bring them back to life, right? When we were living in Taiwan, Janae's childhood friend, actually, they shared a house together. Their family and Janae's family in, I believe, in Santa Barbara area. Janae was growing up. These families living together. He was living in Taiwan. He'd been living in Taiwan for about 20 years. Same city we were living. And um, not a Christian. But anyway, married Taiwanese, raising family there and everything. He was he lived on what was called the Love River, which runs through the center of Kaohsiung. Okay, 10 years ago. You couldn't get near this river. It smelled so bad. Because you had all the sewer and everything being dumped into it. So it's, you know, he said, Love River. Yeah, right. You know, because it just reeked from high heaven. And actually, if people went into it, they would get violently ill. That's how toxic it was. Well, the city of Kaohsiung made a, a conscious effort to clean it up. And they did, for the most part. Well, he, he's walking down the river one evening with his friend. And he sees something out in the river. What is that? And he couldn't quite make it out. And then he sees some splash or something. There's a person out there. They must be drowning. Well, other people see it and they're doing nothing. But he's not that kind of person. So, you know, they have life rings, you know. So he throws a life ring out and the rope's not long enough to reach the person. And he goes, now what am I going to do? This person's going to drown. He jumped in the river. And he pulled the person over to the wall, over to the side of the river. And unfortunately, he couldn't get out because there was this big wall. And he had to wait for the fire department to get there to help him out. But the, and then the person was revived. You know, and he's telling me this story like it's no big deal. And I'm like, you know, I don't know if I would have jumped in that river. Just knowing, you know, the pollution, whatever, 
You know, he ended up, he did go to the doctor and got some shots afterwards. But I mean, that was a brave act. That he jumped in and saved somebody. Okay. You know, we're doing the Alpha Course, and we should have the same kind of vigor to save these lost souls, just like he saved somebody from drowning. You know, the Taiwanese said, Why'd you bother? Why did you bother? Because in their culture, if you don't have a relationship, why bother? Well, if the person's in the river, they're probably committing suicide anyway. Why bother? See, I'm hoping that that's not our attitude here. That we have an attitude that we want to save people. Whether they're drowning in the water, they're drowning in their own sin, they're drowning in brokenness, they're drowning because they don't have Jesus. Unfortunately, what do you think of when you think of the word lethargic? Do you think of God's church, maybe? You know, is God's church a little lethargic? Are they ready to jump in and save the lost? Have they lost the joy of their salvation? Do they still have any drive? Do they still have any motivation? Do God's people begin to think that maybe sin's not so bad after all. Maybe they're in that lukewarm state. Maybe they're walking the fence. Is that how God wants his people? No. What is true revival? Resuscitate. It's even a difficult word for me. Resuscitate. Bring back to life. Be convicted of our own sin. Right? Our own brokenness, our separation from God that sin causes us to be. Our separation from God. That we have to repent. We have to cry out. You know, I've talked about this crying out business before. And I have to admit, it's difficult for me. But what it means is that you are so deeply convicted of your own sin, of your own brokenness, that you've got nothing else to do but you cry, literally cry out anguish and pain to God, to heal, to forgive, to restore, right? And true revival brings a new awareness of the Holy Spirit, a freshness, a new joy a hunger, a thirst for God. For God. For God. And about face. And about face. We have people in here that have been in the military. You know, I, I can't do it on this carpet, but I remember, you know, you had to, you had to plant that foot back here and you had to turn around and, you know, basically do, when they say about face, do a 180. Well, what's that mean when you do that? You know, when you're facing one direction and then you're facing another direction. It means you're turning away from your sin. Yes, you're turning away from those things that are not of God. And you're turning towards God, right? And because of that, lost people are saved. Lost people are drawn to you to know about this spirit that is fresh in you. Their joy that has been rediscovered. Again, the scripture says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. There's a lot of conditions there in a very short scripture. Here we go. If, 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 if. God places conditions. If my people will do these things, then. But what also is in there? It's a promise. It's a promise from God. If you are willing to do these things, then this is what's going to happen. Thank you, Lord. It's a promise. Yeah. If the conditions are met, Expect the results, because yeah. it's God's promise. If they're not met, don't expect any results. 
You continue to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. What do we say? It's insanity. <laughs> it's insanity. You know, if we continue just to meet here on Sunday and not make an effort to reach the lost and expect the church to grow, it's insanity. If we don't make an effort to reach the lost, prayer is essential. Prayer is the backbone. But our feet also have to do the walking. Our feet also have to do the walking. If, my people, if we want revival, then we've got to change. We've got to do an about face. And in this scripture, God's first condition is humility. 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 What's the opposite? Pride. And if we sit there and say, I don't have pride, you know what? You got pride. <laughs> Because we all got pride, right? That's so kind. You know, we all, and, you know, I realize too, pride isn't always a bad word, you know? I think it's good if, if we're proud to be a Christian. You know, and those, I think that's a good way to you, to be, you know, have some pride. We're proud to serve the God that we serve. Right? But when we take pride, we take that I, and it's about us, then we're not humble, right? Humble meaning a dependence. A dependence on God. Knowing that you can't do it yourself. Right? right? And this is the first condition. We have to get to the point where we're willing to bend our knee, to lower ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. And it all sounds really nice, right? But making it happen we all know it's a different situation, right? It's not easy. It's not easy. You know, bend the knee. Literally, to bend the knee. When you bend your knee, this is a position of humility before the Lord. How hard is it for most of us to do that? It, it, it can be difficult. You know, the, the Muslims literally put their head to the floor, which is a totally prostate position, which demonstrates total humility. And just because they do it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. That we shouldn't be on our knees before the Lord and put our head to the floor in a total submissive position, seeking God, seeking God. The Lordship of Christ. In John 15, 5, it's, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do many things. Yeah. <laughs> Apart from me, you do can do nothing. Nothing? Nothing. 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 Wow. Apart from me, you can you know, for many men, those are hard words to swallow. Because we want to feel like we can, you know, strap up our bootstraps. You know, we can take on the world ourselves. That's how we were raised. Be independent. Don't rely on anybody. You can do it yourself. I mean, that's part of the American spirit, right? Don't depend on anybody. What else do we hear? People will let you down. Does God? No. Does God let you down? No. God's condition number two. Here's that word again. It must be important, huh? Humility. Humble prayer. Asking God, seeing the need. What's the need? The need is that you're recognizing you need God. You can't do it on your own. That's right. I can't tell you how many times, I'm not going to go into specifics, but many, many times over and over again when I've tried to do things in and of myself, they have failed. Oh, yeah. But when I have sought God, even after I tried to do it myself, and then finally realized I need God, He delivered. Amen. Yes, He does. I like to have the wisdom that I seek Him first, but I have to say sometimes I think, oh, this is just a simple thing. I can just do it, oh, and then it fails. Seek Him first. Recognize that you need Him. Seek His face. 
Seek his face. What does that mean? Well, again, that's a time of prayer. That's when we seek God, right? But when we talk about seeking his face, this is intense prayer. More than just words. Feelings. Emotions. Pouring ourselves out to God. That he is number one. Amen. He is number one. What's that mean, number one? God is number one. God is number one. What's that mean? You know, we say, you play teams, you know, and you, you beat the other team. We're number one. We're number one. Well, God is number one. Or he should be. And we say, oh, yeah, okay, okay. Well, you know, I recognize at times I'll put my wife number one. No, no. God's number one. Son number one. No. Daughter number one. No. God. God. And I believe if you will honor that and put him number one, he'll take care of the other stuff. Thank you, Jesus. But you got to put him first. you got to plead with him to heal our hearts and our nation. Because without him, it won't get done. That's right. Is our That's nation right. broken? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 It's blood broken. Only He can heal our hearts and our nation. Here's the big one. I mean, this is one of the primary conditions. Not only do we have to be humble, but we've got to turn from our evil ways. We've got to turn from whatever it is that keeps us separated from God. And exactly. And sometimes we have to pray for God to show us. Because we don't know. We're blind. We're blind. You know, if you if you don't, you think maybe you have pride or you don't have pride. Ask God. Yes. God reveal to me in my own life where I have pride, where I need to seek forgiveness, where I need to repent. Show it to me. Reveal it to me yes. in one way or another. And it can do it many ways. It could be through somebody else. It could be through an image or word. It could be any number of ways. Again, action. It's not just words, it's action. When we're living in sin, whatever it may be, it doesn't just affect us. It affects the people around us. Unforgiveness affects our family. It affects our close friends. It's a bitterness that we carry with us that spreads or in anger or a frustration, or whatever it may be, but there is bitterness with it. God, we have to seek Him for forgiveness, and if you have offended someone else, you have to go to that person and seek forgiveness from them as well. Yes. And I also ask, I know I talked about forgiveness uh, a week ago, I ask you as a body of Christ, if you've been offended by someone else, nine times out of ten that person doesn't know that they offended you. As a Christian, you have to go to them and sit down and talk with them and tell them, not out of anger, not out of bitterness, but out of love, that did you know that something you said or something you did made me feel this way. This is how we bring unity to God's church and His family. Is we don't let Satan use those things to divide us. We use those things to bring us closer together as we draw closer to God. God will hear from heaven, but not just words. Because that, because that does the, does God know if we're sincere? Yeah. Yeah. Or if it's just words, right? We have to recognize that we're the hindrance. God is always there. We're the ones that separate us ourselves from Him. So we have to recognize the hindrance, that we are the hindrance, and to seek His forgiveness, and to draw closer to Him, and to cry out. Which means to me, emotions, 
feelings, where they come from, our heart. So when we seek in God, not only are we seeking forgiveness from our mind, we're seeking it from our heart. And that's what God is after. He wants to capture our heart, where our will and our emotions are. And that's where that bitterness is. That's where the hatred comes out. That's where our fear comes from. That's true. We do, we meet all the conditions in this scripture. But it's still God who brings revival. Who brings revival. Right? We can't do it. We can only do the conditions and meet the conditions that he has set forth. But he is the one that will bring revival. And he has to revive us first. Individual, and then the movement in the church. Cleanse our hearts. Restore the joy. And if you're sitting here today and you don't have the joy maybe you once had, find it. What happened to it? Why are we not on fire for the Lord? Why? What happened? We confess our sins. He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He'll break down all the walls to keep us separated. Heal our land. You know, we hear that, and it was in the song, Heal our land, right? Hear us from heaven, heal our land. And Literally, in the Old Testament, you know, direct connotation often was directly to the earth, to the land, right? Because it was agricultural, right? The crops, you know, where, where the animals fit. But I think, and I, you know, you correct me if you believe I'm wrong, this is just my own thought. When God talks about healing our land, I think he's also talking about our government, our culture, people that have turned away from him. He's talking. Send revival. He, he, God will heal the wounds. He will bring the loss back. He will heal the land. And he is the one that will change the world. Just like with the Alpha Course, our role is to bring people here. Our role is not to convince them necessarily to be a Christian. Our role is to present the gospel. We let the Holy Spirit change their hearts. Now we can pray for them ahead of time that God will open their hearts. But we can't change their hearts. Only God can change their hearts. We can do is bring them and have a clear presentation of the gospel and allow the Holy Spirit to work on their hearts. And it may not be instantaneous. It may take some time. We may just be one of the seeds that are being planted along the way. That's okay. We're fulfilling God's command. Revive us. Revive us, O oh Lord. So the question is, is God big enough yes. to do it? <laughs> oh my God. Are we humble enough to lower ourselves, to give up the bitterness of unforgiveness, to give up those things that have broken us and separated us from God to Him, so that He can work in our own lives and He can work in this church, in this body, to draw us not only to one another, to draw us to Him. If my people, when, when that was written in the Old Testament, it was Israel. Now, it's the born-again church. He's talking about everyone here who's accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He's talking to us. If my people will do these things, I will restore them. I will revive them. New revive, revive new life life. 
Does everybody want new wife? Amen. Yeah. New wife. Remember uh, three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember I talked about them a couple weeks ago? They were on fire for the Lord, but when they went to the furnace, they weren't on fire. Because <laughs> God protected them. But by being on fire for the Lord, they changed the whole nation. King Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to worship their God. Their God is the one that's going to be worshipped because they took a stand for the Lord and they, because they were on fire for the Lord. The question is, are you on fire for the Lord? Are you willing to lower yourself, humble yourself, come before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our Creator, our Maker, and say, I can't do it without you. Just a simple phrase. I cannot do it without you. I need you. And I need you now. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Now. Cleanse my heart. Put me on fire. Yeah. The last verse in our scripture today says, Now my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. If we're willing to do that and humble ourselves before the Lord, our prayers now have special significance to God Almighty. He will be attentive to the prayers offered right here in this place. Wherever you seek Him, He can be found. He can be found. Let's pray. Lord, we're just so thankful. It, another promise that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Yet we separate ourselves from you through our own sin, through our own unbeliefs. Lord, restore us back into your bosom. Bring us back to you. Help us create a thirst and a hunger back in our heart for you. Help us make you important again in our lives. Restore the joy of our salvation. May others see what you have done in our lives and want to know who you are. Lord, we do need you. Draw us closer and closer to you. Open our hearts and open our minds to receive what you have for us. Let's all stand as we close.